According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. This is day 225 in our Through the Bible reading schedule. Day 225. So our scriptures that we're going to be reading tonight are Jeremiah 8, 9, 10, and 11. I sound pretty good, at least as far as I know. You think it's going across to YouTube? I guess we'll find out when the complaints start rolling in. Anyway, these are the, these are the things that motivate you to, to be here live and in person. God is spirit. He must be worshipped in spirit and in truth in preparation for the study of the Word of God. Let's take a moment for silent prayer, calling upon our Father and His faithfulness to bless our time in the truth, shall we pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight once again, thankful for your faithfulness, thankful for truth, rejoicing in the privilege and blessing that we have to assemble together and calling upon your faithfulness, your faithfulness to, uh, to bless your word, your faithfulness to keep the uh, technology up and running. Uh, Father, we are here in obedience to you in uh, the pursuit of this uh, race that's been set before us. So Father, we call upon your faithfulness to bless our time tonight, uh, allow for your word to go forth uninterrupted and undistracted. Father, hinder anyone that would want to come in here and, and harm us or, or stop what we're doing. Father, uh, we just call upon your faithfulness once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so Jeremiah chapter 8. We had a little glimpse of it last night, uh, at least the first three verses, which were kind of a carryover from chapter 7. Kind of a curious passage. I've been, I've been thinking about it all day, off and on. I've been thinking about it for years, actually. I'm going to keep thinking about it for years to come. But the idea of digging up all these bones and, and laying these bones out there for, for display. Who's watching those bones? What's going on with those bones? Spreading them out to the sun, the moon, and the host of heaven, which they have loved, which they have served, which they have gone after, and which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. They will not be gathered or buried. They will be as dung on the face of the ground. And death will be chosen rather than life, by all the remnant that remains of this evil family, that remains in all the places to which I have driven them, declares the Lord of hosts. And so we have a global dispersion, we have global harlotry, idolatry, and uh, rejection of the truth. And yet, based on that then comes this next message. So picking up uh, with today's outline, point two, the Lord rebukes Judah with a series of proverbial rhetorical questions. Let me make this a little bit larger. Rebuking Judah with a series of proverbial rhetorical questions. And these are questions that answer themselves, and there's no need to, to literally answer them because the, the expected answer is obvious. Uh, but we start with uh, verse 4. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn away and not repent? Why then has this people, Jerusalem, turned away in continual apostasy? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have listened and heard, they have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his course, like a horse charging into battle. And so it's kind of interesting as you work through this, uh, no person who trips and falls just lays there for the rest of their life, right? I mean, who does that? Who falls down and just lays there? And that's the rhetorical question in verse 4. Do men fall and not rise up again? You know, I mean, obviously, it's just normal when you fall, you know, you get back up again. That's how it works. Unless you're a toddler, unless you're a two-year-old and you're going to lay there and pout for a while and hope that maybe mom comes and picks you up or something or feel sorry for you. But under normal circumstances, uh, nobody just falls to the ground and lays there uh, for no reason. And the idea of the, the requirement for repentance and the idea of a spiritual fall, of the, uh, the apostasy that anyone can fall into, but prolonging it and, and delaying the confession and delaying the, the repentance and the issues there are just nonsensical. Those who fall need to simply repent and turn back to the Lord. What a, uh, what a provision, what a grace provision that we have with 1 John 1, 9, that we can repent, that we can confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, verse 7, even the stork in the sky knows her seasons, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration, but my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. 
And when you don't have the, you know, sometimes we talk about the animal realm, and, and they are creatures of instinct. They, uh, they serve the God who created them, and here we are, a higher order of creation. We're not creatures of instinct. We are rational beings in the image of God, morally accountable in this cosmos system, and yet we don't have the common sense of a stork or a turtle dove or a swift uh, when it comes to these things. Verses 8 and 9, how can you say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what kind of wisdom do they have? Now this actually, it's not a, it, it looks like it's a disconnected paragraph there because of the little gap the NASB people put in there. But it is curious. I, I think it's more connected than, than we give it credit for because the tendency to not repent, the tendency to, uh, to not uh, recover and walk in the light. How hard is it to repent when you think you, you have all the answers to begin with? When you assume that you are the pinnacle of wisdom, you don't see the need to repent because you're happy with what you're doing. And so here they are saying we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us. No wonder they're not repenting. They're pursuing Satan's wisdom. They're not pursuing the Lord's wisdom and they're confusing the two. Like Isaiah said, when you call good evil and evil good, when you substitute light for darkness and darkness for light, it is just a horrible, horrible set of circumstances. So this question, what kind of wisdom do they have? That goes real well with James 3 and other passages where we identify there's the wisdom of this world, there's the wisdom from God, and, uh, and each one considers the other one to be absolute foolishness. James 3 verses 13 through 17 is the, is the text there. All right, so judgment is on the way on the basis of this non-repentance. Therefore I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone practices deceit. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially. Okay? Now keep in mind, as, as wicked as they are and in pursuing the satanic wisdom for what they're doing, they still remain very outwardly religious. They, they're holding to a form of godliness while they deny its power. They're very, they have the externals going on, they have the ritual, they have the, the observances and, and, and all of that, uh, but there's no reality behind it, or the reality that is behind it is satanic. So healing the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially, saying peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination that they had done? They certainly were not ashamed, and they did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment they shall be brought down, says the Lord. By the way, I also believe that there's a prophetic shift here that I have not highlighted in the past, but I'm starting to do more work on this even now. This is a benefit now that I'm learning in the process of teaching this that maybe 20 years from now, if we do it again, uh, we'll, we'll pay some dividends down the road. But I'm, I'm, I'm paying closer attention to the, to the daughters, the word daughter. And the daughter of Jerusalem is not Jerusalem. And the daughter of Babylon is not Babylon. And when we're talking about the mothers and the daughters, when we're talking about a culture, we have the, the, the clues, the indicators in the text that demonstrate what that prophetic shift is about. Are we talking about the here and now? That's the mom. Are we talking about there and then? That's the daughter. Okay, so we have the present Babylon and we have the daughter of Babylon. The present Jerusalem, the daughter of Jerusalem. And the issue is there. I'm, I'm starting to look at this more closely and uh, starting to identify that maybe this is the, uh, the clues that are going to help us to find those prophetic shifts where we can see both the immediate and the long-term fulfillments of what these prophets are talking about. So Anyway, there's, there's other things there that we can get into, but there's the daughter of my people in verse 11, uh, which, which to me indicates that it's not only is it looking at the immediate, but it's also looking forward to Antichrist, tribulation, the eschatological judgment of the Jewish people. All right, then we get to verses 13 through 17, more judgment, and uh, some tough messages that cause the weeping prophet to weep all the more. So verse 13, I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord, and there will be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf will wither, and what I have given them will pass away. Why are we sitting still? Assemble yourselves, let us go into the fortified cities, and let us perish there. 
because the Lord our God has doomed us and has given us poisoned water to drink, for we have sinned against the Lord. We waited for peace, but no good came for, for a time of healing, but behold, terror. Notice the, the, the blaming the Lord for this, the, the shifting of the blame, as if, uh, as if God had let them down somehow. From Dan is heard the snorting of his horses and the sound of the neighing of his stallions, the whole land quakes. For they come and devour the land in its fullness, the city and its inhabitants. For behold, I am sending serpents against you, adders for which there is no charm, and they will bite you, declares the Lord. Again, this is a, a text that we can look at and we have to leave it as an open question until we can really lock it down and, and convince ourselves. We've got to have that conviction that this is, this is immediate, this is short term, this is Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th century BC, or is this not immediate, this is long term, this is tribulation, this is Antichrist, or it may actually be both, depending again on where the markers are in, uh, in each of these paragraphs. I think that I see some indicators here with Dan and the, and the serpents and an indication that, that connects very well with, with uh, Genesis and the prophecy that Jacob had given regarding the tribe of Dan as a horned snake in the path and, and uh, some of the eschatological application there. So this causes Jeremiah to weep for the terminal condition of his people. And for this we're going to go from verse 18 all the way down to verse 23 if you say, wait a minute, there is no verse 23, there actually is in the Hebrew, it just crosses over to the chapter division there. Chapter 9 and verse 1 in our English Bible is actually chapter 8 and verse 23 in the Hebrew. So that's where we're going to take this, verses 18 through 23. My sorrow is beyond healing, my heart is faint within me. Behold, listen, the cry of the daughter of my people from a distant land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not within her? Why have they provoked me with their graven images, with foreign idols? All right, so again, we have clues here in the text. We have the daughter language, and we have the absent king. The idea that the Davidic throne is vacated, that Israel is dealing, and the Jewish people don't have a king anymore. Even though they had a king, even though they have promises that David will not lack a man on the throne, that the son of David will reign forever, we have an indication that there is coming a time without a Davidic king on the throne and the people scattered to the four corners of the earth. Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. I like those idioms, I like those expressions. See, even way back then they would use the seasons to indicate age and to indicate uh, the passing of time and, and, uh, and different things there. So in this case, summer is past and and uh, the harvest is past, summer is ended. Sometimes we talk about being a spring chicken. <laughs> and then um, we talk to some folks and say, you know what, you're not even a, you're not even a summer chicken anymore. I mean, it's, you're fully into your fall chicken status of, of things. And Anyway, just having fun, of course. For the brokenness of, my of the daughter of my people, I am broken. I mourn, dismay has taken hold of me. Something else that you've got to do every time you're reading a prophet such as this, uh, Isaiah, so many of these prophets, Habakkuk, very frequently when he's speaking in the first person, when he says, I am broken, I mourn, dismay has taken hold of me, you've got to go back and look again and say, wait a minute, is this Jeremiah speaking or is this Yahweh speaking? Or is this Jeremiah speaking in place of Yahweh? Is he speaking as if he is the Lord? The daughter of my people, I am broken. And some of, the, some of this comes across. I think this is Jeremiah here, but it's not always clear. You have to kind of, again, stop and examine it and tag it and say, I think this is the Lord. No, I think this is Jeremiah. All right, but the idea of my people are broken, I'm broken. That's a shepherd's heart right there. This is the kind of spirit that you look for in a young man if he's training to be a, a pastor, if he's training to be uh, in the ministry. This is what Paul talks about when he says, who is uh, weak without my becoming weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? And uh, this is the, the, the actual giftedness and ministry of, of, uh, of shepherding that we look for in the church age related to the pastor-teacher gift. Clearly the Old Testament prophets had something comparable. 
Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people been restored? Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. You know, when, when you just have a, you have a tear duct deficiency, you have a, uh, and yeah, there are, yeah, there are conditions that will do that, but he just, he has no more tears to cry and he wishes he has more. He wishes he had a deeper reservoir, a deeper well, so that he could continue these laments. And, uh, but he's, he's exhausted. He's, he's all cried out. All right, which gets us across then to chapter 9. I'm watching this. 8, 9, 10, 11. We've got about 15 minutes per chapter. All right. We're going to make it. Chapter 9. Jeremiah would prefer to live in the desert to living in Jerusalem among the liars there. Do you ever get sick of being surrounded by a bunch of liars? <laughs> you know? And I think there is. I think there's a motivation that a lot of Christians get, a lot of believers get, whereby they just think that they need to go away somewhere, live in a commune, or live in a, in a monastery, just surround themselves only with God's people, and then, and then you know, life is better. Well, guess what? God's people are, are also sinners. They're just sinners saved by grace. <laughs> All right. Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. So yeah, you just need a, a hunting lodge or a shack or some kind of a, a cucumber hut or something to, to get out uh, away from these, these liars. All of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like their bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. Your dwelling is in the midst of deceit, though, uh, though deceit they refuse, or through deceit they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. And how sad is that? Your dwelling is in the midst of deceit. God has caused his name to dwell in the midst of a bunch of liars, right? Where the, his glory is in the temple, where the temple uh, resides. What a privilege that Israel had and how they defiled it how they absolutely rejected truth and, and allowed for the, the God of truth to dwell in the midst of, of a bunch of liars. We're going to see in a couple of weeks, we're going to see that glory depart. The, uh, the prophet Ezekiel is given a front row seat when the glory departs from Jerusalem because nobody in Jerusalem saw it happen. Uh, no one in Jerusalem had eyes to see it happen. But uh, Ezekiel over in Babylon, he saw it happen all the way from over there. And uh, we'll deal with that when we get there. So, uh, yes, Jeremiah would prefer to live in the desert to living in Jerusalem among the liars there. Pursuing lies means pursuing the will of the father of lies. Uh, I think John 8, 44 is timeless. It, it applies in the church age. It applies in the dispensation of Israel. It applies even before Israel to the Gentiles. You are of your father, the devil, right? We're told that Cain was of the evil one and slew his brother. So this is a this is a principle that spans all the stewardships from the Gentiles to the Jews. This is a passage before the church age. Jesus was speaking to Israel. And then in the church age, you are of your father the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. So for those unbelievers and carnal believers that are wrapped up in satanic worldview uh, operations, they want to think the way he thinks and they want to serve him. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so again, just like we have with the mother and daughter language, now we got father and son language related to uh, our adversary, the devil. This willful pursuit, pursuing the will of the father, right? Jesus says, I'm pursuing the will of my Father. My, every message I teach comes from my Father. I don't speak on my own initiative, but as the Father taught me, so I teach. Jesus was always pleasing to the Father because he was always wanting to do the things that were pleasing to the Father. It's, it's one or the other. Which Father are we going to serve on a daily basis? 
This willful pursuit is a refusal to know the Lord. It's a refusal to know the Lord. And this concept here, we encounter it in, in Jeremiah 9, 6, but it comes back again and again. We're going to see it when we get to chapter 11. That'll be later tonight. They have turned their back to, uh, they have turned back to the iniquities of their ancestors who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I have made with their fathers. It's a, it's a willfulness. They refuse to hear my words. 13.10, this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts, who have gone after other gods to serve them and bow down to them. So it's willful, all right? At a certain point, <clears throat> when, you, when you drift from that passive negative volition to the active negative volition, and uh, you, when, when you're not as hungry as you used to be for doctrine, and then it just gets to be where now you are hostile to doctrine because it's, it's antagonistic to, to, to Satan's worldview, and that's what you're, uh, that's what you're pursuing. <coughs> All right, verses 7 through 11, the next section here of chapter 9. <clears throat> God must execute judgment upon Jerusalem in order to be faithful to himself. If he, in fact, if he doesn't judge them, then he, God would be faithless. God would be a liar. God would be, uh, God would be one of those um, empty, empty uh, disciplinarians that wags his finger a lot and threatens a lot, but then never carries through on the threat. You ever have a parent like that? Ever have a boss like that in the workplace? I had, a, I had a, a sergeant like that in the army. And he was constantly, constantly, you know, wagging his finger and had all these or else threats. But we learned very quickly that the or else never happened. That the or else was just, there was nothing to it. And so once you learned that, that there was never, the or else was never fulfilled, then sad to say, it, it really, you know, has an effect. The troops under that sergeant have no respect for that, and, then, and stuff doesn't get done, because there's no consequences. All right, so there are consequences, because God is faithful to himself. God has promised that when you obey, there's blessing. When you disobey, there's cursing. This is the nature of the conditional covenant that was established with Moses. So therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will refine them and assay them. For what else can I do because of the daughter of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceit. With his mouth, one speaks peace to his neighbor, but inwardly he sets an ambush for him. Shall I not punish them for these things? Declares the Lord. On a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? You know, it's very rhetorical, but the answer is obvious. Obviously. For the uh, mountains I will take up a weeping and a wailing, and for the pastures of the wilderness a dirge, because they are laid waste so that no one passes through. And the lowing of the cattle is not heard. Both the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field of the, have fled. They are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. And, and isn't that interesting? The, the justice that he inflicts breaks his heart in a sense. He has sadness, but his sadness is not even for the Jewish people. His sadness is for the hills and the valleys and the animals and the, uh, just the, the, the consequences of, of creation that, uh, that are impacted by the discipline, the judgment that he lays on, uh, on Jerusalem. Of course, students of God's word are going to understand this necessity when you're oriented to doctrine, you get it. You understand it. This is, this is God being faithful to truth. And we can be like-minded with it. You know, uh, it may not be pleasant, but you can appreciate the discipline that the Father loves you with and, and applies. This is the attitude we're all ultimately going to have at the great white throne. Um, praise God that by the time we get to the, the great white throne, we will all be glorified. We will all be sinless and glorified and we'll have the capacity to not be hurt by the second death. Who is the wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined, laid waste like a desert, so that no one passes through? Well, if you have God's wisdom, you know. You can answer that. The Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. 
but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart and after the Baals as their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood. Do you know that language? you know where that comes from? You're going to see it again, okay? And you're going to see it in the eschatological judgment of the tribulation. And give them poison water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have annihilated them. Really, in a whole lot of ways, what Nebuchadnezzar does is just a preview of coming attractions. It's a foreshadowing. It's a, it's a typological prophecy that has its ultimate fulfillment in uh, Antichrist and the, and the uh, tribulation. So students of God's word will understand the necessity of God's wrath. Verses 17 through 22. Jeremiah calls for professional mourners to come for duty. <laughs> Jerusalem will be the deceased. All right, so in the ancient world, this was common, uh, they had professional mourners, and these guys were good. Uh, often they were women, uh, but they could be women or men, and they were professionals. And, and they would wail and wail and weep and cry, and it was a very vivid, uh, visceral a high volume demonstration of sorrow, of grief, of, of uh, lamentation and woe, right? Sackcloth, ashes, all kinds of demonstrations of things. And, uh, and the more you wanted to honor the deceased, well, then the more you would pay to, to you know, you would spring for extra mourners on, uh, on different things. Um, I don't know, I shouldn't laugh. That's it's, it's, it's their, their culture and their custom. Um, anyway, so Jeremiah is now saying we need to hire some overtime staffing on this uh, on these mourners. We need extra mourners. So thus says the Lord of hosts: Consider and call for the mourning women that they may come, and send for the wailing women that they may come, and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may shed tears and our eyelids flow with water, for a voice is wailing uh, of wailing is heard from Zion. How are we ruined? We are put to great shame. We have left the land uh, because they have cast down our dwellings. Now hear the word of the Lord, O you women. Let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters wailing and everyone her neighbor a dirge. So this is not even a short-term mourning or a short-term lamentation. This is such that the wailing women have to train the next generation of wailing women in, uh, in this. For death has come up through our windows, it has entered our places to cut off the children from the streets, the young men from the town squares. Speak, thus says the Lord, the corpses of men will fall like dung on the open field and like the sheaf after the reaper, but no one will gather them. So yeah, there's a happy message. Verses 23 through 26, the only answer for such a time is humility. That's why, again, I say this, this Through the Bible series is so timely. Uh, our nation needs it. Our, uh, the Christians of this land need to be humble under the authority of the Word of God and, and, and serious disciples living out their faith. Oh, I love these verses. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom and let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. Now notice in all three of those, there's three examples there, and all three of them are legitimately true as far as earthly uh, standards are concerned. The wise man is actually wise, but he just shouldn't boast in that. The mighty man is truly, legitimately, genuinely, he is mighty. Don't boast in that. The rich man, we're not denying that he's rich, he's filthy rich. He's, he, that's, this is a reality. Don't boast in that. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. What a principle. Absolute principle on this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Well, how does that happen? Because there's the external and then there's the internal. There's the reality. And you could, you know, all the Jewish people that had the earthly ritual done, they, you know, that was done when they were eight days old, you know, their parents followed the ritual. How does the, 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 the Jewish man boast in that when he didn't even do it? It was done to him when he was eight days old. And he thinks that being circumcised counts for something. 
Uh, he's got to circumcise his heart. He's got to be inwardly. He's got to be uh, loving the Lord God in, in spirit and in truth. Egypt and Judah and Edom and all the sons of Ammon and Moab, all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on the temples, for all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. Absolutely. There needs to be humility and, and true service to the Lord. I like this uh, concept as it gets communicated by Paul in Romans 2. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outwardly in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. And that's really what it comes down to. I, I joke about it when we were in Genesis and we were talking about the, the institution of circumcision and how it was given to Abraham as a sign of the, of the covenant and, uh, and, and different things there. You know, as far as a sign is concerned, it's really rather personal. It's rather private. It's rather unobserved. Okay, under normal circumstances, uh, you know, once you grow up, uh, after your parents applied this, you know, your wife's the only one who's going to see it <laughs> in, uh, in that. But it's a sign between you and the Lord in, uh, in, your, in your personal walk in that. But anyway, let's get on to chapter 10. A satire on idolatry. I like satire. Do you like satire? Um, the neat thing is um, the, the Bible is so rich in, in a variety of different literature forms and a variety of different writing styles between poetry and prose, between um, just, just different things, including allegory when appropriate, including satire, including sarcasm, including a whole lot of things. We don't have any problem with any of that. We get accused of being wooden literalists uh, when just the opposite is true. We, we are faithful to every passage of Scripture. And if it is a satire, we'll handle it as a satire. The, the advantage we have over the, the, the non-literal crowd is that they tend to allegorize everything. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the, uh, the failure of that approach. All right. So let's look at verses 1 through 10 here in chapter 10. Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah delivers a message from the Lord concerning the uselessness of uh, idolatry, the idolatry of the nations. All right. Hear the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations, and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the people are delusions, because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. Very similar, Isaiah had messages similar to this, and the sarcasm just comes across as very dripping with, with the irony. They decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers so that it will not totter. Now, how embarrassing is that when, you're, when your God falls over? Okay? When your idol starts tottering because you didn't make it so well. You should have had a better carpenter, should have had a better craftsman, um, could have used better materials, could have used better tools, whatever the case. You don't want your idol to be tottering. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they. They cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. That's, that's not an impressive God if you've got to carry them around from place to place. Do not fear them for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. So there's no reason to be afraid of them. They can't hurt you. They're not real. They're man-made objects. And just like they can't hurt you, they can't help you either. Why are you praying to them? Why do you think that this idol is going to provide for you, protect you, and teach you, and lead you, and love you? None of that's going to happen at all. So it's a message directed against the United House of Israel. I missed that part. Let me back up. Yeah, O House of Israel. That's interesting. Not the divided kingdom, but the House of Israel. As soon as Judah falls to Babylon, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Israel will be technically united. They're going to be united in their dispersion. They're going to be united uh, in that now both of them are out of the land. Israel was, of course, taken away by the Assyrians. Judah gets taken away by the Babylonians. So the divided kingdom is united. They're just united in uh, the diaspora, the scattering, the, the uh, dispersion among the nations. 
Idols are man-made non-gods, just like Isaiah says, just like a lot of these prophets will, uh, will speak to. Remember the fallen angels, they're the ones that are posing, the fallen angels. Um, I call them the non-god gods, right? Because they're not the Lord God. They will be destroyed when the Lord puts an end to all of their evil. These fallen angels are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire along with every uh, human unbeliever that spends eternity in the lake of fire. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name and might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? Indeed, it is your due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. And this is part of the, the apologetic, the witnessing that the Jews are supposed to have to the Gentiles, the, um, the issues there. Remember when we saw Nebuchadnezzar get saved last night and the, and the testimony that he had to El Elyon, to the, to the Most High God, that uh, here's a Gentile that can consider that the, the God of Israel is the Most High God. He is the supreme being of the universe. But they were altogether stupid and foolish in their discipline of delusion, their idol as wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz, the work of a craftsman in the hands of a goldsmith. Violet and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skilled men. Kind of sad, they got to put purple in there. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus you shall say to them. So is he preaching to the idols? No, he's preaching to the fallen angels behind the idols. When you sacrifice to idols, you're sacrificing to demons. So thus you shall say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. So all of those fallen angels, all of those, they preceded Adam and Eve but they are going to have a, a place of perishing called the lake of fire. It's the fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In many respects, have you ever thought about this? The lake of fire was not, was not originally designed for humanity at all. It was the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It just gets repurposed when humanity gets added to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to that lost estate. All right, he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, by understanding he has stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is tumult of waters in the heavens, and he causes the clouds to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. So in other words, the physical universe, the, uh, the natural laws, the, the, uh, the operation of creation, he, he made it, he controls it. Every man is stupid, devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his molten images are deceitful, and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of mockery. In the time of their punishment, they will perish. Interesting, there is no breath in them, but guess what? One of the unrestrained privileges that Satan has in the tribulation, after the restraint is lifted, when Satan is given more permissive will than he's ever had in the history of everything, he will actually give breath to the image of the beast. He is going, there's a, we're going to study this when we get to the tribulation and the, and the mark of the beast and the image of the beast and the breath that that image is going to uh, receive. For the first time ever, an idol will have breath. They are worthless, a work of mockery. In the time of their punishment, they will perish. So that's what they have to look forward to. But the portion of Jacob is not like these, for the maker of all is he, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. The author of Hebrews puts it this way, it is not to the angels that he subjected the world to come, concerning which we're speaking, but to the descendants of Abraham. It is the Jewish nation that has preeminence in the, in the eschatological theocratic kingdom of the Lord. Not the angels. The angels are servants. All right, so pick up your bundle from the ground, you who dwell under siege, for thus says the Lord, behold, I'm slinging out the inhabitants of the land at this time, uh, and they will cause them distress that they may be found. What a promise. He is slinging them out. And what a blessing that God does when he sends Daniel, when he sends Ezekiel, when he sends his servants, and he flings them out, he slings them out. He's actually saving them. 
causing them distress that they may be found. All right, verses 19 through 22, Jeremiah speaks for Jerusalem herself as she laments her terminal condition. Woe to me because of my injury, my wound is incurable, but I said, truly, this is a sickness and I must bear it. My tent is destroyed, all my ropes are broken, my sons have gone out from me and are no more. There is no one to stretch out my tent again or to set up my curtains. So kind of personifying Jerusalem and speaking on Jerusalem's behalf and how sad she is in this terminal state. The shepherds have become stupid, have not sought the Lord, therefore they have not prospered. All their flock is scattered. The sound of a report, behold it comes, a great commotion out of the land of the north to make the cities of Judah a desolation, a haunt of jackals. Finally, verses 23 through 25. Jeremiah continues to speak for Jerusalem as he prays to the Lord and he asks for the Lord's mercy in the process of righteous judgment. Notice he actually sneaks this prayer in because back in chapter 7, was that last night? The Lord told Jeremiah, stop praying for these people. The Lord actually put Jeremiah under a ban, said stop being an intercessor, stop praying for these people. That was back in Jeremiah 7, 16. As for you, do not pray for this people. Do not lift up a cry or prayer for them. Do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. <laughs> like the Lord would you know, put his fingers in his ears. And, You're praying for Jerusalem? Stop, stop, stop. I don't hear you. But here's Jeremiah sneaking it in when he prays for them here in verses 23 through 25. I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but with justice. Not with your anger, or you will bring me to nothing. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you, and on the families that do not call your name. For they have devoured Jacob, and have devoured him, and consumed him, and have laid waste his habitation. All right, what a great confession. And something similar too, I think Daniel, we're going to see Daniel in um, chapter 9. He becomes a, uh, an intercessory confessor. You ever thought about that? If we confess our sins, why is that plural? And is it possible for spiritual leadership to confess the sins of those that are under their shepherding care? See, like uh, Job did for his adult children, right? We have other examples. Daniel prayed for his whole nation as a, as a prophet uh, representative of the Jewish people. I think we have other examples of that as well. Jesus praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do an intercessory confession on behalf of others that uh, are not confessing uh, for their own sake. All right. Well, let's get to chapter 11 then. I'm even three minutes ahead of schedule. This is our last chapter. And um, are we doing the whole chapter? Jeremiah eleven twenty three. And it is. It is the whole chapter. All right. The broken covenant. And this is important uh, specifically because remember, uh, an unconditional covenant cannot be broken. Only a conditional covenant can be broken. So when we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant based upon the I will uh, faithfulness of God, that can't be broken. Because man has no obligations to keep and, and couldn't break it if they wanted to, or even if they could, it's not possible. They have no obligations. All the obligations are on God's part. And of course, he can't break it because he's, he, it's impossible for God to lie. He made his promises and, and he's going to make good on them. That's true for the Abrahamic covenant. That's true for the Davidic covenant, both of which are unconditional covenants. The Mosaic covenant, on the other hand, is very conditional. It's full of if this, then that, if this, then that. And, it's, and this is the covenant which they break. They break it constantly. The, the reason for their dispersion is because of the broken covenant. And it's that broken covenant of Moses, what we call Mosaic law, it's that broken covenant that requires something new. That's why the new covenant, when it's given, is the replacement for the Mosaic. It doesn't replace the Abrahamic. It doesn't replace the Davidic. It only replaces the Mosaic law. Are we clear on that? All right, so stay tuned. 
the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, we're, we're leading up to the, the, the great new covenant revelation in, in Jeremiah 31, 31. And this is one of these introductory chapters that's, that's getting us to that point. And say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not heed the words of this covenant. Mosaic law has blessings and cursings. And they're on the verge of the maximum cursing as they're having their nation destroyed and being sent off into captivity. Cursed is the man who does not heed the words of this covenant, which I commanded your forefathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, listen to my voice and do according to all that I command you so that you shall be my people and I will be your God. That conditional covenant, Mosaic law, was how they were to operate as the covenant people on this earth, okay? In fact, I wrote about this in in the newsletter. If you haven't read that yet, you need to read that in order to confirm the oath which I swore to your forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then I said, Amen, O Lord. He can, he can testify. He can say, Amen. Mosaic law is conditional, has blessings, has cursings. And right now, the Jewish people are headed for the maximum cursings. So... Um, The Lord reminds Jeremiah concerning the covenant he established with Israel at the Exodus. And, uh, you know, in Jeremiah, I'm sorry, in Deuteronomy 27, this is what it says. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. The whole nation said, Amen. They, They stood out there and they recited them. The blessings on one mountain, the cursings on the other mountain, six tribes on each. They, they entered into this covenant willingly. So now they're going to face the consequences. So the Lord warns Judah yet again, pay heed to the warning given to the Exodus generation. It's not as if they didn't have any warning. They knew about this going all the way back to, to 1406 B.C. Back in Moses' lifetime. As the Lord said to me, proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, hear are the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers in the day that I brought them up from the land of Egypt, even to this day, warning persistently, saying, listen to my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought on them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. So again, this is, how can he not discipline them? How can he not fulfill this? He has to, otherwise... He, may, he makes Deuteronomy a pack of lies. He makes Leviticus 26 a pack of lies. Remember the, the five cycles of discipline and what happens and all the increasing levels of, of divine national discipline? He has to eventually get there. Yes, he's slow to anger. Yes, he is quick to forgive. But slow to anger is not never to anger. You eventually have to get to the, to the wrath of God. And they've reached that point. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked, each one, in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought on them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. So they're getting what they, uh, what they deserve. Now, even while we identify that, they're getting what they deserve. What do you think about that? They're getting what they deserve. But thank God, praise God, that God's a God of grace, right? And so even though Israel is under law, and even though they've broken this covenant, even though they're getting what they deserve, they're getting less than they deserve, honestly, because God's merciful. And He will restore them. They do have a future, a future that they don't deserve. They're going to get what they don't deserve, because again, because God's a God of grace. And when they get to that eschatological theocratic kingdom, more grace is on the way because Mosaic law gets replaced. The covenant which they broke, the covenant which they could not keep is going to be replaced by a new covenant, a covenant which they will keep because they can't break it, a new covenant which will be unconditional for all eternity, a covenant which not only is it unconditional, but he will then equip them 
to keep this unconditional covenant. He's going to give them a new heart. He's going to write his law on their heart. They're going to be uh, spirit indwelled. They're going to be, each one of them is going to know him from the least of them to the greatest of them. The unbelievable Jewish blessings in this eschatological kingdom are, uh, are you know, staggering compared to what they had under Mosaic law. All right. Then two conspiracies are uh, exposed, verses 9 through uh, 13 here. This is kind of neat. Do you like conspiracies? Conspiracy theorist? I'm about 30% conspiracy. Actually, after last Monday, I'm up to, I'm up to about 60% conspiracy theorist now. I am much more on that path. The Lord said to me, a conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their ancestors who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. So first conspiracy, they've conspired against the Lord. Uh, And then we also have the men of Anathoth that have uh, conspired against Jeremiah. We'll get to that in verses 18 through 23. So therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am bringing disaster on them, which they will not be able to escape, though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they burn incense. They surely will not save them in the time of their disaster. For your gods are as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to the shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. So that's the first conspiracy. Then uh, again, he's prohibited from praying for them. In verses 14 through 17, the second conspiracy is the one against Jeremiah. Men of Anathoth have conspired against Jeremiah. The saddest part of that is the fact that Anathos is, is his hometown. So this is his clan. This is his extended family. And these are the, the kinsmen that are closest to him. I'm going to back up to those earlier verses in a minute, but for now let's just get 18 through 23. Moreover, the Lord made it known to me, and I knew it. Then you showed me their deeds, but I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. So here's, here's an interesting thing. When there's a conspiracy against you, but you're a prophet of the Lord and the Lord shows you what that conspiracy is, then you've got to have a humility to volitionally submit to it, right? Because Jesus knew who his traitor was. What could he have done if he wanted to, to to keep Judas from betraying him, right? He could have killed Judas, could have turned him into a frog or sent him to the moon or something. But he knew who the, who the traitor was. Yeah, I know, that's what I would have done. I mean, I would not have let Judas betray me. I who likes betrayal, right? Not when I have godlike powers. I can, yeah, I would turn him to a frog and put that frog on the moon and say, ha, betray me now. But now here's Jeremiah. He's getting, he's getting clued into the conspiracy against him. You showed me their deeds, but I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. And I did not know that they had devised plots against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name be remembered no more. But O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tries the feelings and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. This is an interesting phrase too. He tries the feelings and the heart, the kidneys, the the seat, the the kilion, the the seat of the emotional well-being. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord that you will not die at our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I'm about to punish them. The young men will die by the sword, their sons and daughters will die by famine, and a remnant will not be left to them. For I will bring disaster on the men of Anathoth the year of their punishment. How sad is that? His own family, his own kinsmen. What did Jesus say? A prophet is not without honor except in his own town. Here's, uh, here's Jeremiah being rejected by his own kinsmen, the, the ones who could have blessing by association. They could have tremendous blessings. They could be on board with his ministry. They could be supporting him. They could be positive to the doctrine that he's preaching. Instead, uh, we have a town here that's wiped out that doesn't even get survivors to go into captivity. How sad is that? All right, well, those are the two conspiracies. In between is this section of verses 14 through 17. We'll have to close with this. 
Again, just like he did in chapter 7, the Lord forbids Jeremiah once again to pray on behalf of Jerusalem. He says, stop praying for him. And what's interesting, of course, sometimes I think we get tempted to do this. Do you ever get just so disheartened that you quit praying for America? You quit praying for the president? You quit praying for kings and all who are in authority? Well, we're not supposed to. We're, we're, we're commanded to pray for kings and all who are in authority. And we don't have the prophetic voice coming from heaven, the audible voice that says, stop praying for Joe Biden, right? We, we always are praying for our, our government, praying for our nation. But Jeremiah had the command from the Lord. Do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done many vile deeds? Can the sacrificial flesh take away uh, from you your disaster so that you can rejoice? The Lord called your name a green olive tree, beautiful in fruit and form. With the noise of great tumult, he has kindled a fire on it, and its branches are worthless this beautiful olive tree, and he cared for it, and he tended it. Now he just put the torch to it and said, you're done. The Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced evil against you because of the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done to provoke me by offering up sacrifices to Baal. So much of Jeremiah comes out in Jesus' ministry, you know, the fig tree that withered, the, he pronounces curses upon these trees. A lot of this comes from out of the text of, of Jeremiah. Then that thing gets played out in the life of Christ in his first advent ministry. All right, well, that gets us through the end of chapter 11. We'll come back on Sunday for days, uh, what's coming up? Four more days on Sunday. So this is day 225, 26, 27, 28, 29, all coming up on Sunday. Um, we've got more to do with Jeremiah. We've got more to do with Daniel. Uh, we're going to introduce, we've already introduced Ezekiel. We'll have more to do with Ezekiel. All right. And uh, we're rapidly getting through August and into September, and we're done with the Old Testament. So we've got to get them to Babylon. We've got to get them back from Babylon. Getting ready for the New Testament on October 1st. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for this time tonight. I thank you for the blessing that we have to assemble together. I thank you for the technology, Father, that allows us to stream on YouTube and, and uh, haven't been kicked off yet. Uh, Father, we just thank you for being faithful. We give you the praise and the glory. Father, I continue to lift up uh, this ministry and those that are uh, pursuing this uh, race that's been set before us. Keep us faithful. Keep us diligent. Keep us hungry. Don't let us get bogged down in, in how long this Old Testament lingers. You're in charge of that, Father. Get us through the uh, captivity and back and to the end of the Old Testament. And then, Father, fix our eyes on Jesus. We're looking forward to, uh, to the Gospels. Thank you for being faithful, Father. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Video, printed material, or anything provided by this ministry. Costs associated with such grace provision are paid in full by grace-oriented, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, motivated by God the Holy Spirit, well-pleasing to God the Father. More information on our grace-giving policy and your opportunity to join in this Grace Financial Fellowship can be found at the link in the description below.